I want to talk about a number of things in this video. And I'm making this video because most recently BioWare released the final piece of DLC to Dragon Age Inquisition called Trespasser. I made a video about that on my gaming channel at Stardust LP for those who don't know. And I'll be making another one in relation to that on the gaming channel. But here I want to talk more about social issues as they pertain to gaming as well as a little bit about the the history of of narration and, and how stories are told as well as SJWs, but that's related to the social stuff. So oftentimes, uh, say Witcher 3 has been juxtaposed to uh, Dragon Age Inquisition, and generally speaking, Witcher 3 is regarded as a, a better uh, piece of gaming work, and I certainly share that opinion. Uh, it's not a perfect game. There's some things, minor things, and I would complain about, but overall, the thrust and the story and the game, I feel, are better. And there are a number of reasons for this. <clears throat> what we often don't talk about is um, storytelling itself and, and really two different perspectives on telling stories. So before I go into the so SJW aspects and social aspects, I want to talk about uh, two literary traditions. One is super old, and we're all familiar with That's the, the heroic one. And the other is was pretty much born in the 19th century. And if you're interested, you can read up more on this. I'll post some links. And that is sort of literary realism. In the literary world, in the history of literature, when we talk about realism, we're not talking about, uh, necessarily at least, uh, picture-perfect reflections of real life. That is, you have a gun that works in X way in real life, and then the way the gun works in the game is identical. I mean, so that's realistic, but that's not realism. Now, realism far more represents uh, kind of back to the roots and portraying everyday life. It's a move away from the super heroic narrative that many of us have become familiar with and, and perhaps almost exclusively in the context of video games. And in particularly RPG video games, actually exclusively in that context. And when we talk about The Witcher and the differences, one of the major differences between, say, The Witcher and many, many other franchises is The Witcher is one that is uh, almost, I would say, exclusively uh, of the, the literary realism sort. That is to say, it belongs to that camp. And uh, some authors are, you know, Barzak and, and Charles Dickens, and basically it's a 19th century tradition. And in, in a lot of ways, it represents a kind of active intellectual rebellion against some of the romanticism of the earlier 19th century as well as the uh, late 18th century. And I don't want to go too much into literary stuff, but I think that is the ultimate appeal of The Witcher because it represents a very different <clears throat> way of telling a story uh, from the classic heroic aspect. The, we know the heroic narrative. Usually there's some great obstacle. Oftentimes in RPG it is uh, a great evil or at the very least, an opposing force, and you, the protagonist, in the context of a computer game, uh, have to oppose this and somehow overcome it. And there are perhaps thousands of iterations of this. And duly noted that a heroic narrative for a video game doesn't necessarily need to be a bad thing. It can be really well done. I think overall, if we look back at, and I'll be making references uh, to various older games, Dragon Age Origins, which came out in 2009. That was an excellent game with a heroic narrative and didn't, uh, didn't really lose much in the way of storytelling, I felt, for the most part, just because of that heroic narrative. And there were <clears throat> real conflicts of interest in that heroic narrative. Your protagonist could die. Your protagonist could sacrifice himself or herself. And so the heroic narrative, I just want to make this clear, is not in of itself a bad thing. But one of the things that sets The Witcher apart from so many other fantasy RPGs is the fact that it delves heavily into uh, literary realism of the, of the kind that had been conceived in the 19th century and then uh, transposes that into uh, medieval, medieval uh, Slavic Europe. And it's very consistent if you look at the way The Witcher goes, particularly Witcher 3. I mean, spoilers uh, galore here, but uh, The Witcher 3 is only nominally about saving the world. Yes, there is a plot to save the world, but you, Geralt, that is the protagonist, the main protagonist, 
you're you're not there to save the world. You're there to to survive and to save the people that are close to you. It's it's a very sort of boots on the earth, um, stuck to the ground uh, narrative. You don't. I mean, yes, you have Siri, and she's there to save the world because she she's the chosen one, right? In a way, Siri's the chosen one. Uh, so the only one who can to stop the white frost from destroying all the worlds, in fact. But that's really secondary. And I think that's where, where CD Project Red is really shown as compared to other companies. And one of the reasons why there is... Uh, this this stress on on Witcher versus say Dragon Age Inquisitions because they they really just take very different routes. There's another aspect to 19th century literary realism that you see th- at least in terms of the the formatting and the structure of the storytelling and and how it's been crafted in The Witcher Three and the Witcher series in general, as compared to say Dragon Age, particularly Dragon Age Inquisition, not so much Dragon Age Origins, is you, the everyday life scenarios you see, the dealings you have with commoners, their plights, the monster contracts. I mean, that that's your job, right? It's, it's mundane to you in a way as Geralt, but you're there to handle these monster contracts. And you hear people, you know, people die in sickness. You see the people hanging in the trees. Uh, they've been hanged. Uh, you see people burning at the stake because of intolerance. The Witcher 3 does not shy away from things like this, and it's not controversial because it is 19th century realism in a sense, uh, depicting the everyday plights of of people living in that environment in a medieval fantasy Slavic setting, one where you have uh, intolerance of the supernatural. In the case of the eternal fire, people being burnt to the stake, persecution, uh, people are suffering, you see this. And I don't think it's the suffering per se that makes it such an uh, attractive game. Nobody's saying, oh, lots of death and gore. I mean, you can get death and gore in so many different games these days. It's it's because it has a context. The context is that 19th century realism. You then get a game like... And, and, and so it's dealing with the common man's problem. And, and no, few fantasy games do that. I want to stress that. The common man or the common person's problem. Women are depicted as well. Um, and they, everyone has their issues there. The, the other genre, the heroic fantasy, which is by far you know, the vast majority of them, doesn't need to be done badly, but it, it can be and has been done badly. And I bring this up because I watched some of the Let's Plays for the final DLC for Dragon Age Inquisition. I, I was reasonably impressed, particularly by some of the revelatory uh, stuff. That is, things were revealed that were really interesting lore-wise. And I would argue even overall that Dragon Age as a, as a franchise, Thetis, has a much more interesting uh, lore. It's much more complex in, in many ways. And I suppose that's part of the heroic genre. But let's talk about how SJWs affect gaming in general. Uh, and, and, and people not who aren't necessarily declared SJWs, but people who lean towards that. What SJWs do effectively is they take 21st century extreme left-wing values, for the most part, and transpose them and put them onto a game. So you can argue that Dragon Age is kind of high fantasy, yes, but... Uh, you don't have a world where, I mean, obviously there's suffering going on. I mean, in Dragon Age Inquisition, there's, there's a war, there's a, a magical rift being torn open in the sky, and all these things going on. You don't see a lot of the suffering, very little of it. And what they do is they take these specific values that they have and they put them into a game where it doesn't really make a lot of sense. Uh, you know, a massive war going on, this organization, the Inquisition, etc., and in a way, it, SJWs and, and people of their ilk tend to be blind to the, the very things they're talking about or concerned about. So, whereas The Witcher kind of really delves into this sort of 19th century literary realism in a different setting, you know, realism of the every man, every woman's plight in, in a medieval uh, setting where things are just brutal and tough, 
SJWs who claim to be concerned about the little man and, and people being uh, subjected to to a hardship and trying to help them, you don't see a lot of that in, in games such as Dragon Age Inquisition, where it tends to be very uh, very elevated. And, I mean, it's in, in the same sense of SJWs themselves are, are people with quote-unquote first world problems. And I'm not going to uh, necessarily tra- tread upon first world problems. Problems are always relative to the individual, right? But uh, the the people in this organization, say the Inquisition, the, these are uh, in a way, you know, concerned with really big issues that affect the, the political landscape. And not so much the little man's issues. And, and this is kind of, I find, an inherent uh, paradox and contradiction to the SJW's line of thinking. And this is what they do. It's, again, they transpose 21st century extreme left-wing values onto a game. And Bioware, for better or worse, has pretty much fallen in line with this. This wasn't always the case. Um, Dragon Age Origins, by way of contrast, seem to show a different aspect. The, the humble origins... Uh, the struggles people went through, even though it was heroic fantasy, you still got a, a sense of of common struggle, the common man's struggle. And I think Inquisition really just kind of went way beyond that, and it, it's just you, you're a chosen one, essentially. Maybe you're not in the actual technical sense, since what happened to you is an accident, but you're a chosen one. And being a chosen one rarely has very little to do with uh, the common man's or common woman's experience. Uh, Geralt is not a chosen one. Not really. Yeah, uh, most witchers die in the process of becoming a witcher, true, but he's not a chosen one. Now, <clears throat> this is something that SJW just miss, missing the forest for the uh, for the trees. The They don't realize that all these concerns they have are, are not really being depicted uh, in in the games that they, they tend to cherish. And there's another aspect to this. And of course, I've said this before, we all know women and men are vastly different, particularly psychologically. We've said before, and it's pretty apparent by now, that women and men want very different things from life. Why wouldn't they want very different things from a game? Now, I want to just preface the following, saying I, I don't think this is good or bad per se. This is just what men want versus what, what women want. But let's look at Bioware. Bioware for a long time has had uh, a, a large female player base and one that's been growing uh, continuously. And I don't know the exact demographics and of either CD Projekt Red or, or Bioware, and I know there are some women that do enjoy The Witcher, but it's safe to say that Bioware has far more female fans and customers than, than CD Projekt Red, and that's neither good nor bad. And we also see a tendency of Bioware to stress things that women tend to be uh, con- more concerned with, you know, outfits, uh, things that most men, including myself, regard as not particularly important or ancillary, as well as these sort of intimate uh, relationships. It's not to say, obviously, The Witcher has romantic relationships and so, so on, but they really put a lot of stress on these romances and whatever, and of course, the diversity that goes along with that from, you know, PCism and social justice warriorism and what have you. And I think as the years roll on, we're going to see diversified interests in, in what kind of games come out. Because men and women have very different psychologies and very different interests in real life, generally speaking, there are always exceptions, we're going to see a real kind of splitting. And I think Bioware increasingly is going to move away from aspects of realism. I think there, there will almost certainly focus on um, sort of the classic uh, heroism cycle. But we're also going to see a lot more of what we've come to expect from SJWs and you know, addressing social issues that seem to be largely those of a privileged class rather than the realistic issues of, uh, you know, the, the in, say, The Witcher, where... This is, I'm just making this up. The wife's husband was killed by a monster, and, you know, Geralt needs to take a contract. I don't remember a specific scene where that takes place, but something along those lines. This isn't good or bad. It just is the way it is. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty torn on, the, on this particular issue because, as I said, lore-wise, 
Dragon Age, uh, I think, is actually superior in many ways to The Witcher. It's much more encompassing. There's a much sort of grander scale of things going on. But that's, of course, part of the heroic cycle, whereas The Witcher is much more down-to-earth, 19th century realism. But I would hope, and I don't think this is going to happen, that we have less of this transposition of 21st century political values, specifically, specifically those of extreme left-wing. I also wouldn't want to seem... Uh, see extreme right-wing uh, political values put into a game and a little bit more of a, of a kind of neutral position on these things, a little bit more of a, of a gray shade of, of, of seeing the world, of not saying this is the way it must be, that's the way it must be. And I, I see a sliver of hope here. Uh, spoilers ahead... I stopped playing Dragon Age Inquisition a while ago, but I will say that uh, the most recent DLC and this final one, at least towards the end, uh, because it was quite revealing, you got a, and I don't want to go into the details, you can check it out on my gaming channel, a, a figure, an, anta an antagonist, an arch enemy, if you will, that is, that is multifaceted, multilayered, that isn't just this, this bad dude that you need to stop. And... He, he's even sympathetic. He's kind of like the sympathetic Satan. And I don't know, is this representative of, of, a, of a trend that could define future Bioware games? Who knows? I think it's unlikely, but it does give me some sense of, I hate to use the word hope, but hope, uh, a sense of, hey, maybe they could pull something off that would be at least interesting within the heroic genre. Because the protagonist and the antagonist this relationship in, in the Dragon Age Inquisition, the main storyline isn't that great. I mean, the, he's just a, a black and white evil dude. You don't hear much about him, and you kill him. And who the guy who appears to be Solus, the antagonist in the future titles, the major antagonist, is, uh, is a fascinating guy who can possibly be your friend, and in some cases even your lover. And uh, that makes for interesting storytelling, potentially. But I don't think we're going to see the kind of realism that a lot of us do appreciate. I do appreciate more of the on-the-ground boots realism uh, that Witcher 3 represents and Witcher, the Witcher in general. And I think we're going to see more of that in CD Projekt Red. I think the coming Cyberpunk 2077 uh, is going to be probably along those lines. It's based on a... A, uh, a series that, that arose from uh, R RPG, tabletop RPGs, and uh, it, it should be pretty interesting. I think we're going to see more of that kind of realism, literary realism, of dealing with everyday things. I don't think we're going to see the uh, heroic cycle. And I think for the most part, CD Projekt Red has sort of forged their reputation on the, on the 19th century literary uh, notion of realism as opposed to classical heroism of uh, opposing some great evil. Uh, lots of events going on, you're, you can't stop them all. It, you're kind of trying to figure out how to get through it. So whoever the protagonist is in Cyberpunk 27, uh, 27 7, I think it's going to be along those lines. You know, you're just trying to figure out your own life and, and get through, get by somehow. So Moving towards the end of this discussion, I don't think heroic fantasy per se is, is a bad thing. It can be done really well. Um, but I also think that you, you can also include some of these realistic elements to it. And uh, as in the realism we see in The Witcher. And uh, without, without losing too much of, you know, trying to overcome some great evil. And I'm not too hopeful, but I think the final scene in the final DLC gave us some inkling of, of, of maybe hope that we can go back to complex storytelling with Bioware, maybe. But then again, does DLC can redeem the entire, does DLC redeem the entire company? No, it can't do that. And who really knows? Once again, men and women as well have such different psychologies and interests that it, it seems unlikely that uh, that we're going to see huge changes. The things that appeal to men uh, in games, uh, particularly in role-playing games, aren't necessarily the things that are going to appeal to women. And because in, in, in the wider scale of, of social media, we still live under 
the ideology of men and women are essentially the same, apart from some small anatomical differences. Uh, the idea is that men and women want the exact same thing from a, in, in from life and, and as well as from games. But if men and women want very different things from from game uh, from life, it stands to reason, obviously, that they want very different things from games. Uh, Sims, for example, is far more popular than w with women than it is with men, and Call of Booty or Call of Duty, as some people call it, is far more popular with men. These are extreme poles, admittedly. But when you get to, to the RPG genre, you're, you're going to have to probably swing one way more than the other. And I think it's safe to say that CD Projekt Red tends to swing much more in a masculine direction, and Bioware has swung much more in a feminine direction, which in and of itself isn't a good or a bad thing. It just means that they're, they are catering to their customers. They're, their customers are paying. Many of their customers are women. Uh, in fact, I'm, I'm, it's almost certain that Bioware has the largest female fan base, and they're going to keep on doing that. Unfortunately, that can mean that many males feel you know, excluded or don't want to participate, and that's fine because uh, that's just the way it is, right? That's just the market. But we really need to reflect on the things that we've, we've learned from evolutionary psychology and biology in real life, that men and women want different things, so it stands to reason they want different things from games, as well as on the notion of transposing 21st century, strange 21st century values onto a game versus some of that, that old school, now old school, uh, 19th century realism that we see <laughs> in all places in a in a medieval Slavic setting. So I hope that was interesting. I hope that talk maybe stimulated some further thought. Uh, I didn't put this on my gaming channel because I am talking about more controversial things here, and I tend to, when I talk about more controversial things, I tend to put it on Thinking Ape as opposed to my gaming, even though I am talking about gaming. But as always, thanks for watching, listening, and I will check you guys out later. Until then, may your chosen deity watch over you. Bye-bye.